Okay, welcome everyone to this second seminar of the Center of Mobile Wearable System and Augmented Intelligence. Our speaker today is Thomas, Pl Thomas Plotz. Thomas is an academic at uh, Georgia Tech. He moved there from Newcastle in 2017, so he kind of heard what Brexit and left. And uh, <laughs> he's, done, he's very famous in the community, he's done a lot of work on pattern recognition uh, on mobile data uh, with machine learning, so uh, I look forward to this talk. Thank you. Thanks, Azir. Thanks for having me. Um, Brexit wasn't the final push that uh, kicked us out. And you all know what happened afterwards in November in 2016, right? So there we go. That's where we are now. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I want to talk uh, about computation behavior analysis. So that's what I've been uh, doing the past n years, and n anything between 5 and 10. Um, and primarily through wearables and machine learnings. Uh, my background is in, uh, back in the days we called it pattern recognition, my training is in pattern recognition, and now we call it machine learning, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, I would say um, I did a degree back in, uh, in, in Germany, uh, technically in bioinformatics. Um, this, is, uh, the, this is Cambridge, and I'm sorry to say, but I couldn't care less about the uh, bioinformatics domain. Uh, what I really was interested in building models, building uh, sequential models, time series uh, analysis models, um, for doing cool stuff in this area. So relatively hardcore machine learning. Um, then I had my uh, PhD defense. So in Germany we have a defense. Here we have a viva. And I know for the student that can be uh, uh, stressful. For those of you who have it in front of you, it won't be. Um, in Germany it's a defense. It's a public defense. Public as in public. Public as in your in-laws can be there. My in-laws were there. I knew this before, and they were very, uh, very, uh, very fair and told me that they would show up. Um, my mother-in-law is um, a very intelligent, very smart woman, and she read up towards my PhD, uh, towards my defense, uh, because she wanted to, wanted to know what I'm doing there, yeah. bioinformatics, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I did my thing. Uh, I got my degree, and she came up and said, like, congratulations, Thomas. You're a doctor now. I didn't really quite get, so why is the world a better place now? She didn't quite say this, but you know, she was polite and put it in different words, but that's basically what she meant. And I was like, ooh. So I couldn't convince her that what I did mattered. It's like, ooh, that's bad. So optimistic as I am, I uh, used this as an opportunity and it changed gears a little bit. So I walked away from the core um, method development and tried to find a bit of a, bit of a meaning, trying to be, uh, find a, a, a domain, an area where I could have some impact with my research. Not in 20 years, not in 10 years, maybe a bit earlier. Um, that's when I gradually moved into um, A, Ubicomp, and B, uh, health, health-related stuff. Um, I think I'm one of the uh, attackers that has a greater cohort, as a bigger cohort of people who say uh, they take great pride in being applied uh, researchers, applied scientists. And I'm one of those. I don't think it's a derogative term to say I do applications. I do applications uh, based on, uh, based on uh, underlying techniques that are top notch, but we focus a lot about applications. That's why you become my home community, because this community cares a lot about that. Right? So there's a bit of this flavor in here. There are some technical aspects here, but I want to give you a bit of like the bigger picture of where is this all heading, to, this whole behavior analysis. Um, I want to start with a video. Uh, and before we show the video, a um, bit, bit of a uh, um, bit of an, uh, clarification why we're talking behavior analysis. In many uh, conditions, take autism, take uh, Parkinson's, take dementia, any kind of conditions, what uh, clinicians, what um, healthcare providers, what they're really interested in is uh, to, un uh, to understand what is the behavioral phenotype of the condition. They don't usually stick needles into the patients. Uh, they usually observe, and they observe how is uh, an individual behaving, and based on these uh, observations of the behavior, they draw conclusions and they tailor care, uh, they uh, tailor treatment. That is, in most of the cases, a very uh, manual process, a tedious process where researchers sitting there observing in a certain scenario and doing their notes. That's an opportunity for us as researchers, as computer scientists, um, to tap into to automate some of those. Here's uh, an example. Um, that's the setting uh, of their prototypical behavior analysis in a semi-clinical setting. Um, you might see the striking resemblance of media. That's my son. That's why I can show you this video, because we have consent. He gave me consent. I gave him consent. Um, <laughs> 
That is the scenario uh, at Georgia Tech. They started there, I believe, in 2010, 2011, with a bigger endeavor um, that was focusing on behavior analysis in an autism uh, um, setting. The idea was to uh, build screeners, to build um, methods that allow um, ideally population-wide screening, not diagnosing, that's a different matter, but screening for potential red flags for autism. Right? Because the sooner you can, can recognize it, the sooner you see um, signs of autism, the sooner you can provide care, you can provide support for those, uh, like the parents for the social circles. And that's the whole point. What you see here is he, uh, him sitting on uh, the lap of his mom. Uh, there's these two cameras in there. Um, there is um, a big lapel microphone. And you will soon see that on his uh, left wrist, there's a way too large device. Uh, that measures movements, that uh, measures galvanic skin response in, a, uh, in, a, in an effort to basically tap into so how is he doing, how much is he engaged. Unfortunately, you can't hear the, uh, hear the sound. There's uh, an issue with the sound system here. Um, the whole setting here is an, uh, a playful interaction between the uh, examiner, that's the clinician, if you like, and him. He obviously doesn't know that it's staged, but she staged it. And the whole point is to look into the dyadic interaction. So how is he interacting with her? when she's bringing up a ball um, and playing with him. So the uh, uh, psychologists are looking for signals, for behavioral signals. The very first one is she's calling his name. And then the uh, first idea is to, uh, the, the first hint is, um, does he make eye contact, right? If we call Sora's name, he makes eye contact with me, that's a behavioral signal. That's what they're interested in to, uh, to figure out. Because the individuals who are on the spectrum, they don't often do that. The other one is then there's this dyadic back and forth, so taking uh, changing roles in there, and then she's introducing uh, the ball, and you will see what she's doing right now. Aaron. Oh, the sound. All right, so there was eye contact. There we go, a bit shy. Ready, one, He's not shy anymore. Two, three, go! One, two, three, go! One, sound two, is a little three, off. Go! One, two, three, <laughs> right. Okay. So, she was waiting for the second signal, so she was doing this, uh, she established this routine, they have this, like, this, uh, this joint uh, attention uh, on the ball, and then she was holding it back. Nasty her, and he anticipated, they both had the, uh, the, uh, the joint attention there, and he basically uh, continued this one there. Right? So all fine there, he passed the test. That's an example of uh, behavior assessment that can be, that hopefully can be automated. The whole point is we have um, a bunch of sensors in there, and the original idea of the, of the project, so I can't take credit for the project, this is just my opening example, is to eventually um, equip all the um, daycare facilities, nurseries, with such relatively inexpensive uh, equipment, and train nursery teachers, and then basically have them interact with the, uh, with the kids and eventually have a chance to pick up more cases of, uh, of potential autism sooner. Not diagnosing, right? That's important. Here are the examples. This one is um, already finished. It's Michael J. Fox, uh, the actor who's um, a big activism, uh, activist on uh, Parkinson's. He has Parkinson's. Um, he's now back in shows again where he's not on medication on purpose because he wants to advocate um, that Parkinson's is a, um, is, a, is a disease, is a strong disease, and he is funding uh, research in there and all that. Um, what you saw in there is like this twitching movement, this involuntary movements. That's part of the behavioral phenotype of Parkinson's in this case. Right? That's if you have a patient on medication, these uh, symptoms don't go away, but they're more, more alleviated. That's an example over here, which we had in Newcastle, where we looked into um, building systems, building, in this case, a smart environment, uh, ambient kitchen, I was back, uh, called back then, uh, that observes through integrated sensors what a person is doing in the kitchen in a certain scenario. In this case, it was preparing a cup of tea. And um, occupational therapists told us or tell us that uh, preparing a cup of tea is a very challenging task for those who are uh, on, uh, who have dementia, and it's important to keep track of how well do they cope with these kind of uh, activities, right? And if you realize they're making more mistakes, they're getting slow and all that, so if the behavioral phenotype is changing, then you can intervene, you can provide more tailored care, right? These are all examples of where behavior analysis is important, where behavior analysis can help to provide care, to tailor uh, treatment. They're all in private environments eventually, they're not in a clinic, that's the explicit goal in there. 
right? And that's what we're basically focusing on. We're trying to focus on real life scenarios and trying to build systems that provide us data, that provide us with uh, information that are objective, reliable, uh, and ideally uh, interpretable as well. The biggest change in the last five to 10 years is the emergence of all these kind of gadgets, right? Wearables are a thing now. I'm not a sensing person. Um, I used to do some computer vision. Interestingly enough, I'm coming back to computer vision now. I never did computer vision in Newcastle. Um, the main reason was, and that was funnily enough, when I, when I arrived in the UK, I realized that this is the country with the highest density of CCTV cameras, but nobody allows cameras in the, uh, in the private, room, uh, private houses of the patients. I'm not sure that's true anymore. Um, it was a good excuse for us to not do computer vision. We also didn't have the team for computer vision in there. Um, then the other hand is we have all these sensors now, all these wearables. I'm wearing a Fitbit, all of you have phones and all that. These are opportunities to sense um, behavior, to um, record behavior, which gives us the chance to analyze behavior afterwards. I'm the most opportunistic sensing person on this planet, I believe. Right? I don't really care what sensors we use as long as these sensors give me the data, the, give me the information I need, I, I care about in order to observe about uh, behavior. Well, there's a huge community about um, 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 wearable sensors now and there, and we've used uh, wearables in a number of projects. I don't uh, uh, want to walk you through all of those. As one example, I want to briefly give you a bit of an overview, and based on which um, I shall then um, look a little bit more into detail how we push the boundaries there, how we push um, the, uh, the boundaries of machine and of sensor data analysis in order to actually make these kind of automated behavior analysis um, usable in these kind of digital health scenarios. It looks a little grim. Um, it's behavior assessment for autism research, not in this uh, focus of this uh, screening I showed in the beginning of this video, but it's a, it's a spin out in there which we started, I believe 2011, about the time when I first was at Georgia Tech, where we looked into um, behavior assessment of individuals on the autism spectrum on the more severe end of the autism spectrum. Those individuals, typically kids, aged between six and 15-ish, um, they're typically um, nonverbal meaning communication has to use different channels. They communicate, we communicate with them, but not using normal spoken language. Um, unfortunately, they have a lot of, uh, they show a lot of problem behaviors for various reasons. Um, and these problem behaviors are typically uh, aggressive behaviors towards other individuals, um, uh, towards objects, or towards themselves, self-injurious behavior. Now, what's happening is, and it's our colleagues at uh, Marcus Autism Center in, uh, in Atlanta, they run a behavior treatment facility where they get these individuals in and then work with them over the period of 12 weeks uh, in order to um, develop methods in order to improve uh, their behavior. It's all non-medication based, it's all behavior intervention based. Now what they do uh, in, in the beginning of these, uh, of, these, of these programs, they need to have some sort of an obje objective picture of how bad is the behavior? When do these problem behavior episodes occur? Well, for those of you who have kids, what you could do is you could ask the parents. Well, if you ask me how Aaron is doing right now, I would tell you he's a horrible person. He's so naughty. Um, you shouldn't work with him, which is obviously wrong. Right? If you ask the grandparents who see them like once a year or so, say, what are you talking about? He's the sweetest kid on earth. Uh, it's also not entirely true. Right? So the, the truth is somewhere in the middle. My point is, there's a bias in there, there's, a, there's an observer bias here, which doesn't help you if you want to have an objective um, picture of what's happening in this kid's life. Right? If you want to have a behavior treatment, you need to have an objective um, uh, impression in there. So what's happening in this clinic is that they typically have a thing called a functional behavior assessment in a room. Uh, this room is pictured here, uh, show this in, uh, in a little while a bit more, uh, which is not very nice. It's a, a padded room. Um, you know, to prevent uh, injuries in there. Uh, typically no daylight, they've changed now a little bit, uh, where there's an, uh, a staff member over here um, working with the, an individual and they're basically providing stimuli um, and, and then basically try, trying to provoke certain behaviors in there and then count and measure the behavior according to a certain protocol. So that's what's happening in the clinic. What they actually want to do is they want to measure the behavior in everyday life scenarios, right? These kids go to school. They have a home, they have a normal life, they have a social life, and these behaviors happen there. And it's important to get an impression about what is the behavior like, how, how bad is the behavior, how severe is the behavior, not in the clinic, but in everyday life. All right. 
What we want to do is, because of that reason, we want to build a wearable sensor, because a wearable sensor gives us the opportunity to record this behavior, to assess the behavior where it happens. If it was for uh, the clinic, we just stick a camera in there, do computer vision magic, and all, of, all, uh, all it goes. All right, what we did is we started um, with um, wearable sensors in all four limbs. It worked to some extent. Um, it works to, uh, to the extent that like, uh, attaching sensors on the wrist is fine, on the limbs is typically not so fine because these individuals don't often tolerate that. But we use movement sensors. We use um, much nicer versions than these movement sensors now. These are the first prototypes. It's only showing you very quickly. Um, these are accelerometers and accelerometers only. Because the constraint here, and that's where the reality kicks in, the constraint is that we want to have a, a wearable behavior monitor that, you know, that works for like two weeks. Like the intervals between seeing the, uh, the therapist or the examiner is two weeks. If you use an Apple Watch or anything other fancy, like you know, recharging your watch every other hour, that's not an option, or even every other day. Right? But that's why, in this time, uh, in this case, we stick to very low-level sensing. It's only accelerometers, and then you end up like the uh, typical acceleration machine, like a continuous stream of sensor data, um, based on which we do the analysis. So here are the three uh, important uh, behaviors we are interested in. Right? There's all problem behavior. Uh, um, um, problem behaviors, it's aggressive behavior either towards another person, towards an object, or towards the individuals themselves. These are all actors. These are all staff members of the behavior treatment clinics. That's why I can show you that. Um, what's notable here is the difference in the signals. Right? And that's uh, one of the motivations why we're using, in this case, very specific and tailored, still handcrafted uh, representation of this kind of data. So these are all kind of hits. So hitting the other person, hitting an object, or hitting the person themselves. So there's always a peak, and you see the, the change in the magnitude. Hitting themselves has so much uh, the, the highest impact in there, which is understandable because this person actually sees it coming, sees it coming and uh, retracts. If you want to hurt yourself, you're not pulling back. You really hurt yourself. All right? That's what you, what you see uh, in the difference in here. There's another thing in here, which is this part over here, right? If you hit a solid object, like this table, then the sensor you have um, has substantial um, um, vibrations in there. And these resonances uh, in there, they're very characteristic compared to the other two, right? So what we did is we basically incorporated this kind of information in a dedicated, in a, man a manufactured, or in a, not manufactured, an engineered representation of our data that we can then use to automatically segment what we call behavior episodes. So we chunk out small portions of these continuous data streams, um, which we then put into, back in the days, a relatively standard classifier that allows us to discriminate between those three classes or none of the above. All right? That's how it really looks like. That's a video where we have two staff members, again, um, engaging into this kind of behavior. They're observing every day. Um, the woman, who's enjoying it a little bit too much, I would say, pretends to be the child um, who undergoes the treatment, and the other person is the, uh, the staff member who works with this child. So this is the kind of data we have. You probably have all seen this kind of data. Uh, it's relatively noisy data. It's a lot of data. Um, and down here, that's the annotation we're actually looking for. All right? With this initial uh, workflow we have there, that has much, much more improved now, we were initially able to outperform the best clinical practice as it is right now. And this best clinical practice is that a human observer is on the other side of a one-way mirror, as you can see on the left over there, doing live annotation of what's happening there. They have instructions and whatever. OK, that was the recording, apparently. Uh, whenever something happens, uh, they press a button, and that's the annotation. Right? That has many, many issues, fatigue, human error, et cetera. This system, it's still in the clinic, but it outperforms the best clinical practice. So why are we not using the camera in the clinic? Because remember, we want to have the behavior monitor that we can give to the individuals that can work outside the clinic. Right? That's where we're there. We know we're near there, but that's, uh, that's an ongoing project. So here's the important bit, and that's from the, from the more technical perspective. So what, what can we learn from this one? First of all, there's a ton of noise in this data, and this ton of noise um, means that we need to do something about the signal. And here's the bad news for all uh, folks who uh, are deep into deep learning. 
we don't have a lot of data. Here's the worst news, we don't have a lot of labels. Right? So taking your input cares or PyTorch or whatever and then basically just hope for uh, the deep learning model will sort it out, that's not going to happen. Right? That's a justification for having hand-tailored features, hand-manufactured features that are strong features that capture the, uh, cap uh, the characteristics we care about right into the representation. Um, moving on. This is an example from, uh, from, our, pr uh, from our practice in uh, activity recognition in behavior assessment. That's basically the two uh, schools of thoughts. The first one is you have this conventional pipeline. The conventional pipeline, which in a way we followed here as well, uh, where we look into um, looking to the sensor data stream, carving out small portions in a sliding window approach, uh, small portions of consecutive data, find a feature representation with that, feed into a classifier. That's pretty conventional written up in a very nice tutorial paper over there. Um, field is moving on. Field is moving on towards more end-to-end -end learning. Right? We've done work in this one. Uh, initial papers were like five years ago where people looked into using uh, something like a CNN in order to look at these kind of data. Many papers in this area we have to take with a pinch of salt because many of them are very prone to overfitting, including our own. So you have to be careful there. But that's what people do. Right? We use end-to-end um, -end learning, at the very least, to look into uh, feature extraction, or possibly also into um, sequential modeling. Here's the bad news. The challenge. The challenge is for both kind of approaches. Right? The very first one, that's the biggest one, we don't have a ton of data. Right? So my variable device right now records data. That's a lot of data. It doesn't record a single label. Right? If we use um, supervised learning, which the the, the overarching majority of these, uh, all these deep learning methods of all kind of machine learning methods is, uh, we have a hard time bootstrapping these kind of models because we don't have a ton of labels. We need to deal with that. That pie chart over there, that's the actual class distribution of the, uh, the benchmark data set in wearable computing, uh, in activity recognition. That's the opportunity data set. The brightly colored uh, slices over there, these are the activities of interest. The green part, is the null class. The null class is typically the vast majority, the stuff you're not really interested in. You're usually interested in all those small parts. Now, if you don't do anything about it, and that's like, let's say, 70-odd percent, 75 percent, then any lazy classifier that never looks at your data is 75 percent of the time correct. Right? And you need to actively do something against this. This is a real problem. It's very different uh, in computer vision domains or in NLP or speech. Um, annotation is not an issue. Annotation mentioned over here, um, when you have time series data, it's not so easy by just looking at one sample and saying like, well, that's a cat and that's a dog. You need to say, okay, this one activity of interest starts here and ends there, or maybe it starts here or there. There's a lot of ambiguities. And these ambiguities often um, undermine your modeling and even your evaluation uh, purposes. So you need to deal with all that. So that's the bad news. Here's the good news. We can do something about it. And that's the mitigation. First one, build better features, use better features. Even if you're trying to do end-to-end -end learning, invest into features. Speech folks, uh, they, they are a good example of that. Most of the end-to-end -end learning uh, approaches in speech, in speech recognition, they still use features because they have a good understanding of how speech is produced. Right? We exhale from our lungs and all this vocal tract, in here, including lips and tongues and all that, they change uh, the airflow in a characteristic way which we can summarize in a thing called MFCC, Mel Frequency Exceptional Coefficients. Right? And those features go into our fancy CNN, LSTM, whatever. Right? But invest in features. In images or in videos, we don't do that because we have so many data, we can actually learn all this kind of stuff. We had a lot of uh, discussions this morning about filters and all that. That's what filters do. In our case, where we don't have a ton of data, we shouldn't waste so much uh, modeling capacity on the features. Build better features. And that's what we do. Have more data. Right? As machine learning people, we always say, well, give us more data. Well, if you have more data, all our problems go away. Yes, that may be. Actually, it doesn't. Right? There is more data out now. This is an, um, uh, an effort on uh, UK Biobank. Uh, we, we talked briefly about this earlier, um, where there were um, week-long recordings of accelerometry uh, data for 100,000 participants. That sums up to a whopping 2,000 person years of data, of accelerometer data, with exactly zero labels. All right, there's a lot of data, but you know, if you're relying on supervised learning, not a chance, it doesn't help. You need to do something 
uh, something else about this. Or you exploit the data you have or other data in a cl more clever way. Right? There's um, interesting stuff from uh, five, six years ago, self-taught learning, code, tra code training, transfer learning, et cetera, et cetera. I want to talk uh, later on a little bit about um, a different approach is called uh, ensembles and attention models that now gradually moving into our field as well. First features. In this pipeline, uh, in this uh, activity recognition chain, um, there is a point where there has to be made a decision on a, 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 a portion of subsequent samples of uh, sensor readings. How do you represent this data? I mentioned speech before. In speech, we know how uh, a voice or speech is produced. We have, a, we have an encoding for that. In vision, we have an understanding how our visual cortex works. We can encode that. Sensor data, we don't really know that. Right? There is no direct correlation between the way you move and how these signals look like and how you can actually encode that. As good engineers, what we do, we say like, all right, then we use some generic measures. Generic measures such as uh, statistical moments. So we have, let's say, one second of, uh, of sensor data and we calculate something like the, uh, the mean value, standard deviation, energy, entropy, whatever. Right? Yes, we can do that. We've done this as well. Many people do this. The problem is, the moment you start looking into other application domains, so we have a lot of application domains in the health area, in, uh, in, in sports and well-being. We do climbing, cricket. Um, I have one student working on badminton assessment right now. There's always a time when you have to go back to, uh, to, to square one, you have to retailer, you have to re-optimize your whole pipeline. And that's frustrating in times because none of these features actually generalize. And a good feature should be a feature that actually generalizes. You don't want to tailor your feature specifically only for one application. Uh, that's a problem. We started looking into that, and that was a few years back, actually, where we started um, using restricted Boltzmann machines to actually learn features from large amounts of data, because that's a, usual, uh, that's a, that's a useful approach. Let's say we have a ton of data, but not an awful lot of labels. Why don't we just exploit this kind of data in order to learn a representation? Well, we started with uh, RBMs back in the days, and tell you the truth, it didn't actually work. It was very surprising. We had a lot of data, and it didn't really work. Well, the features didn't really generalize. Until, and all credit goes here to the first author, my former PhD student, uh, Niels Hammerlam. Um, he said, like, right, so the, the only explanation for that is that our representation is still not good enough. So we still have um, a lot of... Uh, informa a lot of data in, uh, in our representation that doesn't really help the model uh, to, uh, to succeed. Um, and then we borrowed an idea from bioinformatics um, where people look into um, sensor, uh, into, into signals, and basically represent these signals through their cumulative density function. We're basically saying that's what we're doing now. On the x-axis here, we now have the ordered or the sorted um, sensor readings of an analysis window. Let's say if you have one second of sensor data, let's say it's a high sampling rate of 100 hertz, so in theory, we have 100 sensor readings on the x-axis. Then we remove the duplicates, and then you end up with something like this. On the y-axis now, we basically project the likelihood or the probability, uh, the cumulative probability that our, uh, our values are less than or equal to a certain term, uh, to a certain value of the x-axis. That gives you the blue curve in there. And that obviously, because it's a cumulative density function, ends at 1. So now we go ahead and um, uh, subdivide our probability actors into quantiles. Let's say we take 10. That's the green dots in there. And then we move to the right on the cumulative density function and back project these intersections to the actual data points in our, uh, in our analysis frames. And those 10 we have now chosen are our coefficients. These are the representation of our data. Where does it come from? If you think about what a good feature uh, does, a good feature represents the data you have in a compact space. Right? The data we have is kind of like a waveform in a certain period of time. So in an ideal way, you basically just subsample the important points in this window. Right? The CDF, or the empirical uh, CDF over here, does exactly that. Right? It focuses the attention on those portions of the signal where there's a lot of information. And it does this very elegantly. Uh, apologies about the quality. I blame PowerPoint. Um, it does it very ele elegantly and very, very efficient. You can implement this in hardware. It hardly takes in time. It's a linear operation. 
It's a linear operation you can implement in hardware, and you don't need much resources for that. I'm sorry, Samsung and Bell and all that. You don't need a deep neural network on this one. All right? More importantly, this generalizes very well. These are six data sets. These are the benchmark data sets in the field. And on these six data sets, we tried uh, a standard classification back, and the classifier doesn't matter too much over here. Uh, we tried four different alternative uh, representations, spectral features, some PCA features, some statistical features, some histograms, and the ECDF. And the ECDF is the red curve over here. What you can see is that the ECDF is outperforming all of those. And that's not just a curated example. That's in all of those. We tried to beat this uh, example for years now. It's, it's really generalizing very well. So that's great. That is great because that, driven by the desire from the application area that we want to have something that we can ideally implement on the device that we can uh, use in, in a generalized way, we have a good feature representation. Here's one problem with that one. Look at the two graphs on the left. These are two different activities, right? Open door one, open door two, from a data set. Doesn't matter what data set it is. They are different, as you can see. The red curve goes down, the uh, green curve goes up. In the way they are mirrored, they are different. So difference means, difference in the activities means that the features should be different. The features should be far away. Otherwise, the classifier has a hard time. That's the ECDF of those two, feature, uh, of those two uh, portions of data. It's pretty much the same. The problem here is that this nice features are just shamelessly advertised to you and uh, doesn't know anything about time. We deliberately got rid of the temporal component in there. And you know, if you're talking about time series data, that's probably not the best idea, even though CNNs do exactly the same. All right, so my student, Hyak Kwon, looked into this in, in very much detail, and he basically said, like, well, maybe should we introduce time there? And so he did. All right, the first idea here is we could basically say, like, our analysis window, let's divide and conquer. We are not looking into the ECDF representation for one window would be basically breaking it out in this case into four sub windows and do the same again and then combine the features afterwards. That's different and conquer. There are two uh, variants on this. One is just uh, use different scales and they're basically just, uh, just reducing the signal in there. Same, same idea for all three, three different variants. The important line here is the last one. The complexity we add is almost negligible. Linear, linear, constant. Right, so for very little price, computational price, which is important for all these uh, wearable devices, we add back the temporal component. And as we show here, this is important because it pushes the, uh, the classification accuracy in the same benchmark here again uh, even further. So we find a way. Um, these are all variants in how we combine those versus the ECDF30, which is the, uh, the baseline uh, on the left. We combine those and find a feature representation that pushes our classification even further, which allows us to do the analysis on the device. Right. That's good features, right? Because, but we need, we, we, we're not living on a rock, right? So the field has moved on. So we can use these more powerful uh, modeling techniques that are out, now, out there now. And we're pushing on this front as well to look into what else can we do to overcome these challenges, these challenges that are so inherent to this domain. Well, we talked about um, exploiting uh, data or other data. And I want to look into specifically the last two uh, ensembles and attention-based weightings. That basically uh, feeds nicely into what's happening in the field in the last two, three years, um, where folks trying to go from this conventional pipeline where we have this um, uh, sliding window approach and then uh, feature, feature extraction classification and rather look into end-to-end um, -end learning. Halfway point there is the one in the middle. That's where we started and where the ECDF came out from uh, eventually where we said, like, all right, so we have all this ton of data. Let's use this ton of data uh, and extract feature representations based on that without uh, the annotation. At the far end, we now add uh, sample-wise prediction, so not this frame-by-frame -frame, uh, analysis anymore, but sample-by-sample -sample prediction um, using relatively complex models in there, bearing in mind that our problem with this more label data set still persists. All right, just a reminder where we are. We still have all these problems. We still need to work all those. They won't go away. That's inherent to this domain. All right, let's look into your ensemble idea. Ensembles were popular when I did my PhD. Uh, Leo Bryman came up with the idea of bagging. 
by basically saying like, okay, here's a data set, and in this data set we can train one classifier, or we just shuffle the data set a little bit, or just jiggle a little bit on the data set, uh, and train a second classifier, and then we do the same again, like say 100 times. Then we have 100 classifier, 102, um, basically trained on the same data. It's not quite the same data, it's slightly modified version of this data. And then we combine all those into an ensemble again, and the uh, combination of those 102 uh, classifiers then is better than the one. That's an old idea. The idea started with weak classifiers. The idea was that all these classifiers they were used, they had to be just better than chance. Right? Now we have strong classifiers. We have strong classifiers um, that use end-to-end -end models um, at a very low level. So the idea here is, in our case, and that's with my uh, colleague Yui Kwan from, uh, from Newcastle, um, that's actually the last paper I did with Newcastle uh, when I was there. Um, the idea here is um, the data we record, there's a lot of uncertainty in this data. There's uncertainty because of the recording, because of the noise, the sensor might get stuck because it's a mechanical device, there might be missing data, there might be issues with the ground truth annotation. We don't know where this issue is. If we knew, then we would, could just model it, but we know it's there. Now, the assumption is, let's assume that there's a certain threshold of data we don't trust. In this case, we said like 20% of the data is erroneous. We don't trust. We don't know what 20% of that is, but we can randomly sample that. Um, that's what we do. We basically introduce variation uh, an element of, or multiple elements of randomness into the whole modeling process over here. Right? We look into, and that's all the boxes in there, we look into small portions of data that are randomly distributed across the, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the sensor data, the data stream. They have a random size within some ranges, obviously. And then we also have a randomized uh, aspect in the, uh, in the whole modeling process, into the, uh, uh, the training process. And that all in itself gives us a diversity that allows us to learn a diverse set of classifiers. We also change, uh, change the loss function there, et cetera, et cetera. Right? The standard model, but now we have multiple um, variants of the data that explicitly capture the uh, variability in there. And then we combine them afterwards. So here are our benchmark data sets again. LSEP means a separator. Um, Opportunity, Palmer, Two, and Skoda, standard data sets in the wearable world, relatively small data sets, um, where we com uh, compare the, uh, the benchmarks, including our old approaches in there, to the ensembles over here. This should be bold phase because these are significant differences. So all we did is here, we used a small trick by saying, okay, we acknowledge the data is not reliable, we cannot trust all the data, we do not, what port we don't know what portion of the data is not uh, trustworthy, but we just incorporate this into the modeling. And voila, uh, accuracies go up, which is uh, challenging in this domain. The second part, if we look at this data, um, it's time series data, so we always need to look into a sample and a sample in its temporal context. How long is the temporal context? Who knows? Typically, we guess this, uh, this context. For a CNN, if you use a CNN for the conventional sliding window, we make a certain guess, and the guess is, you know, how long does it take on average to perform a certain activity? Let's say it's one second and you have enough data. That might be the case. There might be way too much data in one second. Right? It's usually it's very conservative because we don't want to miss any data for the analysis. One second might be too long. Right? So does it matter what you had for breakfast last Tuesday morning, how you're feeling right now? Probably not, but who knows. Right? What we can do now is um, we can borrow a concept from, that, that started from, uh, in, in NLP where there's, there's basically the whole idea of uh, like language processing or language analysis in a spoken sentence is basically all based on functions of the words in there. Right? There's a great German comedian, I know that's an oxymoron, but he's really good, um, Henning Wehn, who uh, is the, the German ambassador of humor to the UK or something. And he has a series, you should look it up, um, where he explains the German language. And the German language is complex, as we know. We have very long words. We also have very long sentences. And the meaning to a sentence comes with the verb. It's not the nouns, it's the verb. And a uh, uh, um, um, uh, kind of uh, characteristic of the German language is the verb is usually coming in the end. So if you want to understand the 
structure of a German sentence, you need to follow the sentence all the way along to the end until you finally have the verb, and the verb basically can change the whole meaning of the form. Attention models look into that. Attention models look into um, uh, relationships between these parts of, in this case, a sequence of words, and then basically put a, uh, a weighting scheme on top of those. So what we do is we do the same, but in our sensor data. Funnily enough, that paper was um, published last year at ISWIC. Uh, at the same time, there was um, a competitor who had exactly the same idea. Well, and what I like in our community is they said, like, all right, fair enough, fair game. You both came up with the same idea at the same time, so we published both papers. So that was good for us because that paper is actually better than ours. Because right? what they did is they, did, they had did exactly the same idea, putting an attention model. Again, attention model learns during the model training, learns the distribution, the weight distribution, over the history, so over the previous time steps, um, and incorporates this into the modeling. They did this, we did this, it's great. They also did it the other way around. Right? They also learned weight distribution over their sensors. Right? You typically have multiple sensors, like an accelerometer has three axes, if you have a gyroscope, you have another three axes, if you have a magnetometer, another three, you have more sensors, and so on. Not all of them are of relevance all the time. Right? So, all credit to them, wonderful uh, extension over there by basically doing attention in time and uh, along the, uh, the sensor axis, which is essentially feature, extra, uh, feature selection. That's enough credit for them. That's our results. We started with a uh, state-of-the-art model, uh, Roggins, uh, uh, Ordinance and Roggins uh, conf LSTM, so you have a bunch of convolutional layers, and then you have the LSTM taking care of the, um, of the uh, the sequential data, and then we add on top of that the, the embedding on the, um, uh, the attention modeling. So here's the first interesting result. All right, so we look at um, three data sets again. We have, in this axis, we have the two competing, um, at the time, uh, leading models uh, and on these domains, and here's the one with the attention model. All right, and you see, as you could expect, if you look into the, uh, uh, the, the importance distribution, the weight distribution over time, that you gain substantial uh, impact uh, over the state of the art. Not so much over here. Right? So the opportunistic or the optimistic interpretation, well, at least it doesn't hurt. Right? So this is a problem over here. There's no difference. It even gets a little worse. It's not significant, though. So that's why I can, I can bring this here. What's that? It's very small, exactly. It's a very small data set. So we believe and we convince the reviewers that this is an, uh, is an artifact of the data set. Let's leave it there. The other paper has the same issues. What's more important is, what can we learn from this one, actually? And let's, let's look at this one. This is the weight distribution over the previous states in our, in our model. Well, it's exactly as it was in the, uh, in the baseline paper. We had like eight hidden states. Uh, and bear in mind, we put the attention model at the end after the LSTM. So this kind of monotonic increase of the weight is to be expected. That's right. Every single LSTM cell encodes the past. And the further you move forward, the more past you have to encode. Right? That's not so interesting. Let's look at two examples. It doesn't matter what, I, uh, what um, activities these are. All these uh, rainbow colored uh, boxes over there are different activities. All right, let's say one activity is uh, the bluish one and the other one is the green one. Now what's important is that the distribution of the immediate predecessor and the one before is flipping according to the activity. So for one activity, the immediate predecessor is more important than for the other one. That's an interesting example. That's an interesting finding because that eventually allows us, hopefully, and that's what we're working on right now, right now to use these attention models for something like segmentation. So if we knew that the model would focus on a certain bit of the data, then we could basically say, like, all right, then let's use that and segment our whole data set according to the attendance. There's even more. What you had for breakfast last Tuesday actually doesn't matter. All right, so in this case, that basically means we can prune our temporal context, and the first or the, the, uh, the oldest two timestamps, they are not of importance. So we don't need them. We have not incorporated this knowledge in there that's extracted by the model in itself, right? All right, just to sum up. We do computation behavior analysis because we care about 
uh, the application domains in health. That's our primary application, primarily um, health in humans. We want to build systems, we build systems that assess health, that assess behavior uh, that's related to health outcomes in, uh, in the wild settings, ideally. With the uh, autism example, we are still in the clinic, but we are using a wearable device in order to move out of this clinic. Right? That's the promise of the wearables. Again, I'm not, um, I'm not, not a sensing person, I'm opportunistic in there, but sensing uh, that is wearable, that is movable, that is mobile, that gives us what we need. And that's our foundation in here. Um, there are substantial challenges to the data analysis. Right? And the data analysis primarily suffering from uh, the amount of labeled data we don't have. There's unlabeled data. We are swimming in unlabeled data. Right? There's 2,000 years of bio, uh, biobank data. My phone is recording data. All your phones are recording data right now. Nobody's annotating this. So we need to deal with that. So that needs new methods in there. That's why we're looking into something like uh, dedicated feature extraction, what I presented over here. We're looking into attention models. We're looking to uh, exploiting our da uh, data in a more efficient, more effective way that we can actually bootstrap these models that actually work afterwards. There's some progress made. Um, there is still a lot of challenges there. So one challenge is um, segmentation. I used to say, I'm, I'm walking away a little bit from that, sliding window is evil. Right? A sliding window means you have a time series analysis and you chunk, uh, carve out a portion of the data and that's the analysis, you, uh, that's the portion of data you analyze in an IID uh, way. Those portions, they are not independent. It's a time series. We shouldn't do that. Uh, temporal uh, data, sequential data need sequential models. Take this with a grain of salt. We have access to raw, uh, large data sets. I know some folks here work on this data sets on the biobank. There's other huge data sets that have been recorded. Let's use them. We have one student work on it right now where we basically say like this whole classification business, maybe that wasn't such a great idea in the first place. Right? If we have a data set that consists of 75% or even more of null, of the data, we don't really care too much about it. So why don't we torture ourselves and focus too much on modeling all these target activities? Why don't we focus on that what we can actually do for which we have data, which is the null class? Why don't we model the null class and say something like, okay, here's a notion of normality. And we build a really good model that captures normality. And the moment the new data that's coming in doesn't, uh, is not explainable by this notion of normality anymore, then we say, hello, that's something abnormal. And that might be our uh, our next step for, for classification, because these are the activities we actually care about. Thank you. So Thomas is here after his talk for about an hour or so, so if you want to talk to him privately, um, you can do so, but if you have questions that would interest all of us, please raise your hand. So, so, so we focus on parameters primarily because we, we had this, typically we had in most of these applications constraint that we need to have a sensor that we can give to the patients that records for, let's say, two weeks. Right? In two weeks, then you have to really scratch your head about uh, what kind of modalities can you have. Gyroscope in itself already um, is an order of magnitude more energy, so that's typically not an issue, uh, not, not, not a question there. Um, that has changed a bit. Um, what I liked on this uh, com competition paper and attention modeling is that they really cared a lot about it. So we do at the moment, we don't do much about multimodality other than just integrating everything into our uh, input space and then let the model uh, learn on that, which doesn't go very far. I know that um, you did some work there where we basically have per modality different, different models. That's one approach. Um, I like the, uh, the feature selection idea in there. Right? Opportunity is the one data set everyone uses. Uh, and that's the wearable sensor, 77, uh, 77 channels. And these poor participants, they were like robots that all this kind of stuff. That's not gonna fly, right? So we need to have some sort of a notion of what, what sensing modalities are of importance for what kind of activities. And that's a moving target, it depends on what you do, right? So we don't do much in there yet. Hi. 
Thank you for the talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, have you come across, probably you have, uh, you have Um, I don't think there's a right way of dealing with sparsity because you're missing data. So whatever you do, you make a mistake. Right? So if you ignore it, then you, know, you still want to know what's happening. Uh, then there's imputation stuff. Um, I had some discussions earlier this morning. I, it's nice as well, but it's wrong because you're inventing data. Um, I'm, I don't have a solution for that. I tell my students, don't extrapolate data because you're making a mistake. That is true. Yes, that is true. So if you're lucky, uh, which often is the case, that uh, not all of the modalities fail at the same time, uh, then it's fine. Uh, then one modality should substitute the other or should compensate the other one. But what, if you, what, what do you do if you know, your phone is dead and the phone is your point of access to your patients, then you're missing data? Well, <laughs> I had one, one student in, uh, in, in Newcastle who was looking into how people share their Fitbit data. Um, it was interesting because um, you built a platform and all that um, and there was this portion of time in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock where there was a huge activity. It, it wasn't Fitbit, it was actual accelerometer data. And everybody looked at him and was like, hmm. And then he, you know, he blushed a little bit and said, okay, let, let's take this out. It's like, well, that doesn't help, right? Because if there's this gap of, let's say, an hour or something in the middle of the night, you don't have data, but you know you can infer about what's happening there, right? So, yes, you can infer from historical data. Historical data only captures you know what happened in the past, right? That's the the old Kalman filter example. If the Kalman filter only knows go this way, the moment you hit the wall, the Kalman filter says no, it's fine. It's not fine, right? That that's the point. Even if you have other modalities, you might be able to compensate, but whatever you do is wrong. One thing is more wrong than the other. It's sorry, it's even worse. The, most of these data sets follow a protocol. So the, the participants, they're basically engaging into a, a sequence of activities. So that is why I'm saying that whether the intuition behind attention models can be well captured in these kind of data sets, whether you need a different type of uh, data set, training data set, uh, for actually evaluating your model. Mm -hmm. because, because the intuition, I, in my personal opinion, does not necessarily uh, is well represented in these kind of data. I'm not sure I agree. So the, the ultimate goal, what we wanted to do, just pushing the numbers. I mean, that's fine, but you know, that doesn't solve any, any problems on there. The ultimate goal, what we want to do, is we want to use these models, and these models should figure out, so what part of the data is actually relevant for making a certain decision. And if we step away from classification, right? Classification is, yes, what you said, well-created protocol, people following this one, it's not very natural. But if you step away from that and basically say like, right, it's not classification, it's more like the segmentation. So what parts are different? Then your attention model comes in again. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you so much again. Thank you.